Welcome to the regular board meeting of the Houghton Catholic District School Board on Tuesday, March 19, 2019. Please re be reminded that this meeting is being recorded and will be posted later on the board's YouTube channel. Uh, Trustee Matzo, would you lead us in the opening prayer, please? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy Father, spring is a metaphor for change. Some changes we eagerly await and some we abhor. Some changes we plan and others arrive uninvited. To all these changes, we ask the gift of your perspective beckoning us to expectation, hope, and rebirth. May the sunlight and the rain be reminders that you are at work renewing the earth. As a God of renewal, you are ever at work in our lives, too. Open our eyes and lives to the needed changes in our lives this spring. Awaken us to new life and perspective, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Trustee Matza. Um, <clears throat> Vice Chair uh, Murphy, would you, could you please the, uh, read the motions adopted in camera? Thank you, Mr. Chair. 1.2 motions adopted in camera. A motion regarding property was adopted in camera. 1.3 information received in camera. The following information was received in camera. Kevin Campbell retiring effective March 31st, 2019. Karen Becker, Tony Seelan, Amy Main, jo Joanne Powell, and Jennifer Eust retiring effective June 30th, 2019. Paul Ciancolo retiring effective August 30th, 2019. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Trustee Murphy. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? Trustee Agnew. Seconded by Trustee Duarte. Can I have yes. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to add one information item uh, to the agenda, uh, Ontario Autism Program update. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can 
Can I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Trustee Guzzo. Trustee Duarte. All in favor? Motion passes. Uh, moving on to presentations, we now uh, invite Jack Amendolia. I'm sorry, sir. Oh, declarations of interest. Yes, sir. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. I am declaring a conf uh, conflict of interest on item 10.7, 2019-20 budget survey results. Uh, teacher salaries are mentioned in the survey. My wife is a teacher with the board. Discussions on this item can at some point affect the pecuniary interest of teachers. Okay. When we get to the item, we'll step out of the room. Point of order is public meeting. I can stay in the room as long as they don't participate at all. All right. So, item number four presentations. Uh, uh, Mr. Amendolia from Watson and uh, Associates will give us a presentation on EDC charges. and I'll leave it over to Jack. Um, so the purpose of this presentation tonight is to provide the Board of Trustees with a little bit of an overview as to the, uh, the application and scope of education development charges as they relate to, to the provincial standard and how they relate to the Board, as well as to bring you up to speed as to where the Board currently stands with its existing 2018 education development charges bylaw. Uh, where we're moving to next and some of the occurrences that's happened over uh, the past year that have uh, changed our normal course of action. So with that, I pass it over to uh, Mr. Jack and Mendolia. Thanks, Fred, and thanks to the board for having me here tonight. Um, as Mr. Thibault mentioned, uh, really the purpose or why I was asked to speak to you tonight was really to give an update as to what's going on with regard to the education development charges. Um, also a little bit of a refresher, knowing that many of the trustees were newly elected this year and haven't gone through the EDC process yet. I think it's important to have a little bit of an EDC 101 so you guys have a bit of an understanding about what the process entails. <coughs> In addition, the board has to amend their current EDC bylaw in the next couple of months. So prior to that amendment, um, it would definitely help to have a, a little bit of basis and understanding of what that process looks like as well. So really to start off, what we're going to talk about is what an education development charge is. So the definition of an education development charge is it's a development charge that is imposed under a bylaw respecting growth related net education land costs that are incurred or proposed to be incurred by a school board. So really what that means is that the EDC is a charge. It's a charge that we levy on new residential or non-residential development. So when you go out to take a permit, whether you're an individual taking out a permit or whether you're a developer taking out a, a thousand permits for a new condo or for a new subdivision, to every permit there are attached different fees when you go and take out that permit. And one of those fees that are attached to that building permit is an education development charge. So when you go and you take out that permit, that's when you pay the EDC and those EDCs are then collected by the municipality and then the municipality transfers those funds over to the school board. The revenue that the boards collect from the EDC is then used to purchase school sites for new schools to be built upon. One important distinction is any revenues that are collected for EDCs can only be used to purchase new school sites and to develop those school sites. So no monies to the from the EDCs can be used towards actual construction costs. So right now, the EDCs for boards that have them, for boards that qualify EDCs, are really the primary source that those boards have, like I mentioned, to fund those new school board acquisitions. And that's for school boards that are experiencing growth in their jurisdiction. That's important to note because knowing today's funding model, in the past, boards had taxation open to them. So they can adjust budgets on a yearly basis if they didn't have enough funds, let's say, to buy new schools. Because that option isn't available to school boards anymore and boards now rely more on, on a, a provincial grant fo uh, fund model, um, these EDCs are really important nowadays because it's really one of those only funding sources that boards have that still allow you a little bit of flexibility to actually go out and purchase school sites and not rely on government funds to do so. 
So right now, the board's existing EDC bylaw covers your entire jurisdiction, which is the region of Halton. Your existing education development charge is $2,269 per residential dwelling unit. So as I was talking about before, if I go take out a permit for one new residential unit, I would pay $2,269 for that unit. If I was building 10 houses, I would pay $2,269 times 10 permits and, and so on and so on. The non-residential charge that the board charges is 58 cents per square foot of gross floor area. And the, the charge is actually divided 85% towards residential and 15% towards non-residential. And what that means is within the EDC bylaw itself, there are certain b uh, policies that the board, the board of trustees, decide on. So a couple of those policies, the legislation allows you to charge anywhere from 0% to 40% of your education development charges to non-residential development. The average around the province is around 10 or 15% for most boards. Some have zero, some have a little bit higher, but the average is around 10 or 15%, and that's what your board has is a 15% non-residential charge. The same as your coterminous board, the Halton Public Board as well. So both boards charge EDCs, both in the region of Halton, both on this 85-15 split. So the calculation itself is, is very formulaic, it's very technical, it's very prescribed. The Education Act, the Ontario, Ontario Regulation 2098, and in addition the government has also put out a set of EDC guidelines that they ask consultants and boards to follow when calculating the charge. So there isn't a lot of leeway for boards or consultants to determine how to calculate this charge. It has been very prescribed for us. And up on the screen now, there's just some general steps that, that we follow in terms of the calculation. So obviously demographics, enrollment projections are what determines our need. How do we know how many school sites or how many new schools the board is going to need over the next 15 years? We do enrollment projections. Like I said, legislation, board planning, and in addition to those enrollment projections, tells us how many school sites we're going to require. The land appraisals determine the site acquisition costs, and I have this underlined only because I'm sure, even if you don't know a lot about EDCs, I'm sure trustees have heard about the increasing DCs and EDCs in, in the province. A lot of it is really direct, directly related to the price of land. As we're aware, the price of land has been skyrocketing. We'll look at this. Um, in a couple of minutes, but that's really why EDCs have been going up. And we get qualified appraisers to do appraisals for us on a per acre basis throughout different areas in the jurisdiction to come up with their per acre values. Uh, site prep costs, so have to develop the site so a school can be built on it, grading, um, bringing services to the lot line, that's all based on actual historical board construction costs of new schools that you're building. Uh, reserve fund. So if the board has a surplus or a deficit in, in your existing EDC reserve fund, right now there's a deficit, that gets rolled into the future charge as well. Those total costs, so the uh, enrollment determines how many sites we're, we're going to need, the appraisals and the site prep costs tell us how much that's going to cost, the reserve fund tells us what our balance is at. Basically all of those costs combined are what we call our total net education land cost. And that's ultimately what we're trying to collect EDCs for. And then, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, there's different board policies, res, non-res, whether the charge is applied uh, equally across the region or there's area-specific charges, whether we apply it to um, single-family homes, the same as we apply it to condos. Those are ultimately policy decisions that the trustees make. That's the last step. Right now, your bylaw, like I mentioned, 85-15 res, non-res split. It's applied uniformly across all areas of, of Halton, so whether you take out a permit in Milton or in Oakville, the charge is the same. And whether you build single family, townhouses, apartments, the charge is distributed equally among all, amongst all types of development. So before a board, w once you go through those steps, there's certain things that the board has to do before you're legally eligible to pass an EDC bylaw or a new EDC bylaw. So all boards have to prepare an EDC background study, and that's where the consultants come in, and that's what we help the board prepare. The background study itself, and this is different from municipal development charges, if, if anyone's familiar with that. In municipal development charges, there's no approval of that study necessary. With the school board development charges, the Minister of Education must approve the assumptions in the background study. And I have that bolded only because that relates to sort of the update <coughs> and where we're at with the ministry right now. 
The board has to have public meetings before they pass a bylaw, so there is a statutory public engagement process, and the study must be available at least two weeks prior to that first public meeting, and as well, notice of those public meetings must be provided at least 20 days prior to that first public meeting. So with regard to where we're at and what's going on with the ministry right now, so just I'll try to be brief, um, but I'll give a, a, a quick history of sort of what happened and, and where we're at today. So when, these, when this board and your co-terminus board uh, were in the process of passing their renew the renewal of your EDC bylaws last spring of 2018, uh, we were going through the process. We knew that there was a provincial election coming up. So we were in constant communication with the ministry, ensuring that the provincial election wouldn't bump into our renewal uh, uh, process, EDC renewal process. We were constantly assured by the ministry that the election wouldn't be an issue until I think about a week um, before we were considering bylaw passage, where we were notified by the ministry um, that the approvals that I talked about, the background study approvals that are necessary to pass a new bylaw, wouldn't be approved by the minister prior to the election, but we were assured that the approvals would be forthcoming uh, post the election. We were just told that uh, perception, optics, it had become an issue and the government didn't feel comfortable doing this before the election. Um, we were told after it wouldn't be a problem and that it was a non-government matter because I asked the question, what if the government changes? We were told it's an internal ministry matter and that it would, it would all be done shortly after the election. Shortly after the election, we received word that the new government that was in power is not going to approve the background studies or any background studies until they've done a more fulsome review of the EDC legislation. So what ended up happening at that time is the bylaws have a maximum period of five years. You can extend it no matter what, no exceptions in the legislation. So because the board didn't get their approvals last year, these board, the two boards in Halton, their bylaws actually lapsed. And when the bylaws lapsed, there was no EDC in place. So if you're going to take out a permit, the $2,200 charge that we were talking about was zero. So what happened is permits that were taken out during that week that we had a lapse of a bylaw obviously resulted in a revenue loss for this board and for your co-terminus board. As a result of that, there was political pressure put on the government and the ministry um, by your board and board of trustees. And as a result of that, we entered into some negotiations and discussions with the ministry, and they agreed to give um, a, a, a conditional approval, I think is the best way to put it. Um, and basically what had to happen was that both boards, both Halton board trustees, said that they voluntarily are going to approve this study at the existing rate, so not at the proposed increase in rates that were proposed last year, but at the existing rates for a period of, a maximum period of one year. So that was this, this um, handshake agreement. There was nothing changed in the legislation at the time. It was a handshake agreement that was made between these two boards and the Ministry of Education to basically get the bylaw back in place to stop the, the lack of collections that was going on in that, that week, week and a half, I think it was. Um, so, so the bylaws were put back in place, like I said, at the existing rate that they had before the, we were considering a renewal. Um, and, and sort of that was that for the time being. In the interim, what happened, so you see at the bottom of the slide, October 12, 2018, provincial government actually made a change, an official change to the legislation. So these, these bylaws were in place under this sort of handshake agreement. Then in the fall of 2018, the, the ministry actually made a change to the legislation. So they amended Ontario Regulation 2098 with Ontario Regulation 438.18. And basically what that legislation did is it really mirrored the handshake agreement between the Halton boards and the ministry. So the legislation officially froze all EDC rates that were in place as of August 31st, 2018 at that effective rate. It limited the boards to change any areas that their bylaws were subject to. So let's say you had a jurisdiction-wide bylaw and the board said, no, we want to go area-specific or we want to take you know, Halton Hills out of the equation. The legislation effectively froze the rates and didn't allow boards to make any of those policy changes that I spoke about. Um, so it really, in essence, froze the rates, limited the boards to change the areas of which EDCs applied in, and limited the board to make any policy changes. 
Um, it also, a couple of things that don't really apply to this board, but if you were a board that was looking to implement EDCs for the first time, that was actually frozen. And it also streamlined a few of the requirements in terms of what we have to uh, give the ministry for their review. So that's where we're at. We're still in this frozen state. A um, couple of things I want to end off on. So because we're in this frozen state and because the board, these two, the Halton Catholic Board and the Halton Public Board, had to pass this bylaw before the legislation change got made, we're still under that handshake agreement where we were only able to pass a bylaw for a maximum term of one year. We're still able to uh, pass a bylaw for a maximum of five years according to the legislation, but the ministry asked us for a one-year maximum at that time. So in the next couple of months, what the board has to go through is an amendment to their existing EDC bylaw. It, assuming we don't hear anything from the ministry that changes anything, if things stay status quo, the rate again will stay the same because it's been frozen according to the legislation. The amendment will just increase the term of the bylaw to prevent it from lapsing. So um, the board is probably going to increase it for another year or has the ability to increase it up to four more years for a maximum of five years. Just quickly to end off tonight, um, a couple of things. So just so the board's aware, what the proposed charge was going to be last spring before the ministry implemented this freeze was 36.48 per residential unit and 83 cents per square foot on the non-residential side. So again, just for awareness, um, the current rates that are frozen are about 62% of what the proposed residential rate was going to be last spring and about 70 on the residential side and about 70% on the non-residential side. So I just mentioned earlier I had that line underlined about appraised values and, and how we determine the cost of land and obviously ADCs have been increasing rapidly over really the last 20 years. Just so you, so again for awareness um, purposes, the land values that you see on the screen right now were what were used um, last spring for the calculation of the new EDC. So you can see rates in Oakville almost 2.4 million per acre, in Milton about 1.8 million an acre. I'd argue that those are already a year later well higher than those. Um, and in Halton Hills about just under 1.6 million an acre. The chart on, on the very bottom right there shows what the values were when we did the study in 2013, so about six years ago, compared to 2018. You can see that Oakville was under a million um, about six years ago. Milton was, I think, around 500,000. Halton Hills was in the 400,000 range. So we can see when we talk about EDCs going up, just looking at this chart gives us a really clear indication of why those land value, or why those costs have been increasing over the last several years. So just a quick review, um, like I mentioned at the onset of this presentation, EDCs re enable the recovery of growth-related land costs only, so an important distinction. Not all school boards qualify for EDCs, so you do have to meet an eligibility trigger. The bylaws themselves have a maximum period of five years, no exceptions. The background study assumptions must be approved by the minister before a board can pass a new bylaw. And right now, all EDC rates across the province are currently frozen pending a Ministry of Education review. We hear that there's possibilities that the ministry may come um, with some options or some news um, probably in the fall, or sorry, in the late summer or early fall. Um, so again, pending this bylaw and, and the expiry that's coming up, we are not likely to hear anything from the ministry before that. So like I said, ministry review is ongoing. Our bylaw, this board's bylaw expires in July 2019, so must be amended uh, prior to that expiry. And I'd be happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Something quick. Uh, the timeline, tentative timelines as to what we want to do to uh, make the amendment to extend the bylaw for one year is in your package. It is on page two of the report and two of the package. Uh, it provides the brief timeline as to when it will be presented to the Board of Trustees. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Amendolia. Any questions? Mr. Murphy? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just trying to understand uh, the government's motivation, which is a very difficult thing to do, we all know. Uh, so the EDC charges are paid by the developer, which is ultimately built into the cost of the home. 
market pressures will dictate whether that's acceptable or not. If it's not, the price of the houses are too expensive, there's less people, there's less need for schools. What is the, uh, what is your perception of the reason why this is frozen when really it has no impact on the provincial government whatsoever? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'll be careful how I answer that, and just so trustees are clear, this is my opinion and my perception. Um, and, and I have been involved in government negotiations with my firm um, in community consultations, both with the government, with the development community, so I have some background and, and some awareness to that question. The government's rationale as to why they're reviewing EDCs and DCs is their, their rationale is affordable housing. And they're saying that there's not enough affordable housing and one, and they're basically looking at four different components of, of why they're looking at affordable housing or what aspects of affordable housing they're looking at. One of those components that involves my firm and the EDCs was government imposed fees. Um, so that can be DCs, it can be building permit fees, it's, it's all government imposed fees that go into development. Um, so that, that was the rationale as to why they're reviewing this. And if they can reduce government imposed fees, the argument is that house prices would go down. And more importantly, I think, from what the development community is telling the government, it's not so much the quantum of the fees, but it's the process that goes into development and how that's slowing down and bottlenecking supply, which is causing an increase in house prices. When you ask me my perception and my opinion, and, and we have a lot of data to back this up and we've provided it to the government, like you alluded to, these fees, especially government imposed fees in general, are a minuscule amount when we're talking about the, the factors that go into the price of a house. I agree that they're typically built into the price of the house and passed on to the home buyer. I would agree that economic factors like interest rates and borrowing and debt have much more of a factor on housing affordability. Um, EDCs, like I said, government-imposed fees are a small percentage of that uh, price of a house, of a new house. And when we talk about DCs, maybe they're a little bit larger, but when we start to, to really talk about EDCs, they're, they're a minuscule amount that would never move the needle in terms of, of factoring in, in terms of housing affordability. So, so I guess the answer is the rationale um, used by the government was to study housing affordability and, and how government imposed fees relate to that. In my opinion, I think it's, it's you know, you're kind of barking up the wrong tree if you think that those are going to reduce the cost of houses. And quite frankly, like you said, the market bears what the market bears. If you took EDCs and you know, reduced the, house of a price by a, you know, the price of a house by $1,000, the developer is not necessarily going to knock $1,000 off that house. It's probably going to go to profit margins because if the market can bear a million bucks, then that's what people are going to pay. So, sorry, a little bit of a long-winded answer, but I just wanted to ensure that all the facts were out there. Trustee O'Brien. Yes. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. So, if we do pass a new bylaw that lasts five years, and the government does um, reconsider in the fall, can we change our rate? I think you might even sit in here. Yeah. So, good question. So. If you had a, a five-year bylaw and with, you know, next year the government comes up with new regulations, so the board has a couple of options. If those new regulations weren't so material as to having to do a new background study, new enrollment projections, new appraisal rates, we may be able to amend the study because we're allowed to amend the study to increase the rate of the EDC up to once per year, up to once in a calendar year. So again, if they weren't material and the, and the government said, hey, we've studied it, um, you know what, we agree the rates in your background study that you were going to implement in 2018 are, are good to go, go ahead. We, can, we may be able to do it with an amendment. If there are more material, we may have to open up the background study again and redo the background study. So it, it, it's hard for me to answer until we know sort of what those changes look like and that's gonna, that's gonna be sort of the driving factor as to whether the board has to do a new background study. If I were to add just one more uh, piece. Uh, <clears throat> if you look back at the 2013 EDC bylaw when we passed the background study, the board did endeavor to do at least an annual amendment to those charges uh, so as to keep up with the annual escalation of land. So that makes it so that we're not incurring as much of a deficit or more debt as we're buying sites pretty much every year. And further to that, it smooths out the curve as well so that it's not a staggering increase as you saw uh, between the first year and the fifth year. So that was also appreciated by the development community. Any more? 
Trustee Carabella. And during that, thank you. During that uh, week and a half where there was no, where our, our bylaw lapsed, were there many applications? Did we lose a lot of money? A lot, yes. Some of it was luck or bad luck. Um, I think a large condo development just happened to go in with 500 units that week. That was the bulk, I think, of, of the loss. Um, some of it was, you know, savvy developers. If you had your, you know, ducks in a row and you were ready to put your permit in and you found out that you had that week, then, yeah, there was definitely a, a rush, I think. Um, but, yeah, some of it was just bad luck. But, yeah, it was, it was significant. Trustee Murphy. Uh, so we have a, a short, significant shortfall in the funding, 30, 38%. Um, so what is, what's the practical implications of that? Is that just a deficit that builds and builds? And then how do we deal with it or we just leave it on the books and keep it, keep it building? Yeah, so again, depending on if the ministry changes the rules, let's, let's assume that the rules stay the same and as they are now and the board and ministry allows boards to re-implement EDCs. That, that deficit gets rolled into the next EDC. So every time the board has a deficit, when we calculate, let's say for example, we calculated the net education land costs and they were $100, and the board had a $10 deficit, your net education land costs would then be $110. So if this deficit continues to, to expand because we're not collecting what we should, it's just gonna make those future EDC rates higher. Any other questions? Thank you. Mr. Chair, and through you, uh, presenting the artificial turf replacement project for the Bishop Reading Catholic Secondary School. Uh, so this project is exactly as it sounds, replacing the artificial turf carpet uh, at Bishop Reading. Uh, this project was originally contemplated as part of the 2019 facility renewal projects, um, but as it was removed um, due to the complexity of coordinating the addition there along with the, uh, the turf removal, um, as, we, as you all know, we have a, a, a large scale uh, addition project plan for Bishop Reading, um, which is now approved by the ministry. So uh, a lot of the site reconfiguration and uh, parking reconfiguration will take place this summer. Uh, so without the complexity of, that, of doing the turf and getting the turf in and out of the site while doing the parking lots at the same time would be would add too much complexity to the site. Um, however, uh, through our discussions with the town of Milton, uh, they've actually offered us, they have a parking lot just to the south of our site um, that actually touches uh, the, uh, the artificial turf field. They've actually offered us to use their parking lot as a staging area to access the, uh, the, the turf field, uh, which would allow us to do it uh, at the same time and do it this summer. Um, and I, I can say as well that uh, assessing the condition of the field, um, Bishop Reading was installed in the second year that we installed uh, artificial turf surfaces at our schools. So we did, um, over a period of five years, we did all, of, all nine of our secondary schools. Um, and Bishop Reading was in round two of that. It is by far the most used turf field that we have in our board. Um, Milton Youth Soccer uses it a ton, um, basically every night of the summer um, when it's accessible. Um, so it, it, it is in need of being replaced, um, and, uh, and, and as such, uh, we propose a project tonight. So, um, so the, the idea would be we'd run this project concurrently with the addition project. Um, they wouldn't be uh, tendered to the same company. They'd be run as two separate projects, uh, but the work would take place over the July and August period uh, this summer. 
Um, the project cost is estimated at $900,000, which is inclusive of professional fees and contingency. Um, of course, it'll still be competitively tendered to get the best price, so um, we'll, we hope that the, the bids come in lower than that anyways. Um, so we have two resolutions uh, for trustees' consideration that'll come back at the, the April 2nd board meeting. Uh, the first is to approve staff to proceed with the project, and the second is to approve the project budget. So I'd be happy to take any questions that trustees may have on this project. Trustee Antonov. For you, Mr. Chair, um, what is the replacement time? The Typically, duration, that is. Uh, the replacement time for this would be, sorry, in, in terms of how long it's been there? No, 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 the rape, it went in in 2009, if I remember yep. correctly. So how long is it going to take to replace it? It's typically about four to six weeks. It really depends on when you lift up the carpet, how bad the base is. Um, but we anticipate about four to six weeks, so well within the nine weeks that we have of the summer summer break period. Follow up. Does that pay for itself, you know, given the high usage? Are we collecting sufficient funds to go into the replacement value of it? Uh, I, I would say certain fields that we have do. I think Bishop Reading being our highest use would definitely um, we would recoup the cost, both in terms of, def uh, of avoided maintenance costs for cutting the grass and lining the field, um, as well as the, the rental fees that we recoup um, through our, uh, our community use programs. Um, other ones have more challenges. Uh, you know, Bishop Reading has lights on it as well, so we can use it extended hours in the evenings and in the fall. Um, other um, sites such as Oakville, we have no lights in any of our fields in Oakville, so they're more challenging to recoup the cost. Any other questions? Okay, moving on. This item is going to be added uh, on the April 2nd regular in-camera meeting. Uh, Superintendent Carl, please report on the 2019-2020 school year calendar. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm pleased to present the staff report on the school year calendar for 2019-2020. Uh, I want you to note the calendar was created by our school year calendar committee, which includes members from CPIC, OACTA Elementary and Secondary, Halton Student Transportation, QP, our principal associations, and our board chair. Uh, we also consult with the Halton District School Board, as there is a financial cost for transportation when we do not align our professional activity days with theirs. Uh, so I'm happy to report that our community came to a consensus with the calendar and that we're in alignment with the Halton District School Board calendar, and we provided a summary of the topics for the professional activity days. Uh, I would want you to know we are anticipating that based on recent ministry announcements there will be a change in one of the topics for the PA days. At this time we do not have specific information on which PA day that will be. Um, and we'll be looking for a resolution on the approval of the calendar at the upcoming board meeting. So I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Any questions? No questions. So this item is going to again uh, be dealt with uh, on April 2nd, regular and camera board meeting. Uh, we're moving on to information items, and I'm going to ask Secretary Daly to uh, address autism update. Sorry. We want to deal with it at the end as opposed to the beginning. Okay. At the end? Do. Yeah. So we'll go to, we'll stick. No problem. Yeah. We're flexible. So, um, in that case, I'm going to ask uh, student trustee Mazza to please report. So uh, we have a student senate meeting on March 26th, which is next Tuesday at Bishop Reading. So we hope to discuss with the students um, their perspective on the new changes, um, student trustee elections. We might get sweatshirts for senate and stuff like that. Um, we also have a See the Problem, Be the Solution Gala coming up in April on the 4th at Corpus Christi. So this is where we recognize the students' efforts in uh, making the songs or artistic submissions to our See the Problem, Be the Solution initiative, and we present the winners with their check. Um, we also have student trustee elections on Tuesday, April 23rd at Loyola, and that's about it. So if you have any questions, let me know. Any questions? No questions. Oh, Trustee Carabella. Thank you. So do you already have the um, students student trustees who are candidates? Have they already submitted fi their uh, their names? Um, I think we're, they're in the process of doing that. So that, um, they have to submit to their principals first. So I think the principals are looking it over now. And like by the end of March, I think they'll be finalized. Trustee Antomasi. Um, they do not. I was not last year. Any other questions? 
Thank you, Trustee Massa. Moving on to the next item, uh, Superintendent Nair, please report on uh, school educational field trips. So the trips, uh, the spring trips that the schools are taking are before you, and as well, uh, you'll see towards the end of the package um, a number of our, our school trips based on um, students qualifying for the Office of Championships in various athletic events. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions? No questions. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Merrick, can you please report on uh, St. Nicholas Catholic Ele Elementary School? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, uh, presenting the construction report for St. Nicholas School for February. Um, so you can see the work today has been done, has been primarily setting up the engineer pad for the, for the school. Uh, we now have footings going in, um, mostly complete for the classroom section, the back portion of the school. And actually masonry work started yesterday on the, on the, on the back portion of the school as well, so the walls are, sh are starting to take shape. Happy to take any questions that trustees may have. Any questions? Thank you. Moving on to, again, Mr. Merrick, to report on the St. Mark Catholic Elementary School. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, this is the St. Mark School Edition Project construction report for February. Uh, so we received occupancy back on February 26th. The school moved in to the, uh, the, the, I guess, the ground floor of the school, the first floor. Um, to the classroom portion on March 4th, and the early on in child care are moving in this week. Um, so the school is starting to take shape, and everyone's moving into their to their new spaces. Uh, we have a few items to clean up uh, within the building, uh, as well as the outdoor play area for the child care center um, needs to sit, uh, take place as well once we have the weather improving. I'd be happy to take any questions that trustees may have. Any questions? Trustee uh, O'Brien, sorry. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, to Mr. Merrick. There were some issues about playground being iced over. Does that do you feel addressed? Yeah. So with the well, a, a lot of the uh, blacktop play area, the asphalt play area, was uh, um, was blocked off for construction for the majority of the winter. Um, since the construction is now complete, we've scaled that back. A lot of the asphalt, um, a lot of it was ripped up to bring in the new services for the addition. Um, so we've actually ripped out all the asphalt now and brought in limestone screenings and packed it. Um, so there's an outdoor play area now. It's kind of like, I don't know, I compare it to playing on a baseball infield. It's kind of um, the, the surface we have there now. Um, once we have the, uh, the, the portables that the students were in moved out uh, in the spring, we will be repaving the entire area um, as the, the rest of the field takes shape. But um, the, there is an outdoor play area for the students now. And they'll, they'll be back on the field again as the snow melts in the field and it comes back in um, shape for the, uh, um, or dries out for the, uh, the spring season. I'll be back in the field as well. Any more questions? The next item, again, Mr. Merrick, is a report on Assumption, Assumption Catholic Secondary School. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, this is the uh, construction report for the Assumption Edition Project for February. Uh, as you can see, we have interior demolition is wrapping up now. Um, we have the mechanical and electrical uh, works ongoing in the building. Um, coming up in this month, we'll start the exterior foundations for the new addition and then continue with the, the M&E work on the, both the new addition as well as the, uh, the renovation works to the, um, to the uh, existing building. So I'd be happy to take any questions that trustees may have. Any questions, please? Thank you very much, Mr. Merrick. The next item is long-term capital plan and update, updated projections from uh, Mr. Thibault. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is just an update report as to the, the progression of planning services updating the long-term capital plan. Um, just to bring you up to speed, uh, last year we started the full review um, of the plan and updating it based on what was uh, first presented in 2013. Now that, that was approved in principle by the Board of Trustees, what we're moving on now as a new initiative by planning services is to do annual updates. As we were discussing earlier with EDCs, things change quite rapidly on an annual basis. So now we'll be doing updates to that report on an ongoing basis. Um, right now we're essentially in the uh, third portion of the process. So we've, uh, we've announced what our work plan was. Now we've provided the ministry projections that were presented to the Board of Trustees in uh, December. So you're part of that process. Now, uh, upon further review and updating the student population yields that we're generating from development, we've updated the projections and refined them. 
even further. And now we've taken all this information and we've reposted it online on the school planning website and in the long-term capital planning section. So if you look to the report on uh, page two of the report, page 34 of the package, there are four or five links that go directly to your respective pages, whether you want to look at it as a regional outlook or by municipality. And all the projections have been updated with new charts and um, new fact sheets on each area. Now the next step in this process will be occurring as uh, on April 2nd where Planning Services will be presenting a, the uh, annual facility accommodation report which will identify what we believe are uh, an update to the dates on our projected capital projects that we're looking to, so new schools, additions and things of that nature, uh, other projects as well as identify spaces that may be available for community partnerships which aligns with our uh, board policy. I-37 Community Planning and Facility Partnership. So that was part of the, uh, what was referred to as the pupil account, or pardon me, the Community Planning and Partnership Guidelines uh, released by the, the Ministry a little while back. Um, so below are the additional milestones. So again, we'll present that report to the Board of Trustees and then uh, we'll keep you updated on a go forward basis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thibault. Any questions? Okay, moving along. Uh, Ms. Kidding, uh, please report on the 2019-20 uh, uh, budget survey results, please. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the budget consultation report in your um, agenda package is uh, um, alignment with our strategic plan um, in the priority of foundational elements. The purpose of this report is to provide the trustees today with a summary of the feedback that was gathered through the 2019-2020 bud budget survey, which is um, part of the board's annual budget process to gather feedback from stakeholders. And uh, the survey was administered online. It was um, launched Tuesday, February 19th, and it was closed on Thursday, February 28th. And we received a total of 954 responses from parents, students, and um, staff, as well as uh, non-parent um, community members. So you can see we do actually include all of the survey responses if someone wants to go through those. They're there for your information, but we did summarize a couple of thousand uh, open-ended responses for you all um, and found some themes that were pretty consistent with um, strategic planning, um, specifically with uh, student achievement, focus on technology, special education, and, um, and promoting our students and our, and our staff. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions? Trustees are not done. Thank you. Uh, just a question, Laura. Um, this year, over other um, surveys, is the response rate higher, the same, or lower? So I only really, um, thank you for that question. We, I only really looked at last year, and we did see quite a, quite a drop from last year. We had over 1,400 last year, um, so about a 40% drop. Rusty Murphy. Uh, have the themes or concerns been relatively consistent? They have. So last year, a slightly different setup of the survey, but we did find that there was a large um, percentage of parents that prioritized technology, specifically access to technology. There was also a huge um, uh, emphasis on special education, um, ensuring that we have the support and increased, um, decreased waiting times. Uh, there was also a focus on mental health that was pretty consistent throughout uh, the two past two surveys. Um, materials for the classroom is another theme that comes through very strongly. Um, one of the things that came up this year that wasn't really present last year was a class size. So one of the themes that came through very strongly was maintaining class sizes, probably in response to rumors of the government. But other than that, we were seeing the themes pretty much consistent. Any other questions? Trustee Carabella. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. So, how does the um, um, how are some of these uh, things going to be implemented, or did the finance committee look over some of the suggestions? So, not my department. So, I'll refer to Director Daly to field that, or someone maybe. Through you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. At, uh, at this point, Trustee Carabella, it's really information uh, for trustees um, to start the process. And as we start to go through 
our budget process at the departmental level. It'll, it'll lend some input to you in terms of what our stakeholders uh, think is important. Any more questions? Okay, we're going to move to item 10.8, uniform policy. Uh, Trustee Agnew and Zernaita have asked to put uh, this for discussion purposes. So over to you. Um, as noted on the agenda, it's under the information portion of the agenda. Um, this is just for me bringing forth to my fellow trustees. Um, in Halton Hills, we recently had two votes um, at two schools. And if I could defer to Superintendent Crowell for some data, uh, just for information purposes, to let you know how those votes ended up in the situation in Halton Hills. Actually, that wasn't the question I was expecting you were to ask, but that's okay. I'll do my best. Um, we did have actually three three schools that recently went through uniform votes. So St. Joe's Acton, um, St. Bridget in in Georgetown, and uh, St. Scholastica in Milton. So I don't have the specific numbers for you, um, but I can tell you that the vote was unsuccessful at St. Bridget in St. Joe's Acton, and it was successful at St. Scholastica in Milton. Since we're such an awesome team, I have them here. So, um, so in St. Joe's, there was a 79% response rate. Um, so 42% voted yes, 58% voted no. Um, at St. Bridget, there was a 91% response rate. Uh, ballots sent out 532, 182 votes for yes, which is 37.5%, and 303 votes no, which is 62.5%, which I already stated with a return rate of 91%, which in my personal opinion is a very high voice of our stakeholders. Um, so, Trustee Agnew, would you like to add anything? Or? I think we just wanted to bring it forward because of the recent um, votes and sort of how they went. And we know that the policy is not, a review, uh, not up formally for review until 2021, but this has obviously kicked up some conversation out in the community. So just wanted to sort of gauge the temperature from you know, fellow trustees on um, you know, their, your thoughts around things. Are you getting feedback? Um, you know, are you having conversations with people? Are they looking to have this looked at earlier than 2021? Um, so, you know, again, it's, I think with what was happening with some of these uniform votes, it has started that conversation maybe a little bit earlier um, than, you know, would have been necessitated through that policy review. So we just really wanted to have a, just a discussion around it. Just as a point of observation, if I may, I think there was a change. I think there was a change in uh, suppliers. Uh, not too long ago. I'm just wondering whether uh, the results reflect that change. Um, and also, um, I think traditionally we always used one supplier. So I offer my thoughts on that. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, just an historical observation. The Georgetown community, the Halton Hills, has never embraced the uniform in any of their votes for uniforms in the past, whether it was McCarthy's or in-school wear. Um, other communities, of course, across our other, you know, Oakville, uh, Burlington, and, and Milton have had a variety of responses. The one observation I would make is I believe there is a process for recall, i.e. that a school council can put the vote to their community to no longer have a uniform. And my observation would just be that no school community, given that option, has ever exercised it in a vote. And I only offer these pieces of information just as historical observations. Uh, if I can comment, um, if the school uniform policy goes away and I'm a trustee, I'll be living in the shed. It's a nice shed, but it doesn't have any heating or plumbing. Uh, no, just kidding. As an observation from what I overheard um, in our community, in, in the community I live in, in Milton, that most of the parents are for the uniform policy and they embrace it and they love it. Uh, I'm just wondering through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to Trustee O'Hearn, is there anything that we can do better up in Georgetown? Because they're obviously not buying <laughs> what the board is selling, essentially, and that is uniforms. Um, have you heard anything? 
can we do something, perhaps as uh, Superintendent McGillicuddy suggested? Um, from the data that I've gathered through the, through the two schools that just recently went through it is uh, the top um, response was too expensive. So whether the data supports that, it's a perception, those are the optics, I don't know. That's the response for the nose. Um, and the same with St. Joe's. There are other things as far as one supplier that came up as far as the no responses. That's all the data I have to talk to right now. And really, really the conversation is just, and I know historically Georgetown has never supported a uniform. So I guess my question is, what are they telling us? Like Trustee and Tomasi is saying, what is it that they want? Um, so I'm just bringing it forward. Do we want to discuss it or do we want to wait to 2020, 2021 to the policies up for review? Uh, follow up? Through you, Mr. Chair. So the thing would be is to maybe go to the principals, the stakeholders up there, and have a meeting to find out exactly what it is that they're not buying into. Is it the quality? Is it the pricing? Is it a combination of the two? And perhaps, you know, when the RFPs come up, which I believe are this year, um, if I'm correct, that maybe we negotiate something that is more affordable, and perhaps that may resolve some of the issues. Superintendent Grohl. Sure. If I can just maybe clarify a couple of things. First of all, there is the RFP process which is coming up. So our, our contract with ISW does end at the end of this uh, calendar year, so December 31st. So our purchasing department is currently working on putting together a committee, which we like, which we will sort of prepare the um, the tender the tender part of this. Um, we would have the opportunity in that through that RFP process. So there is trustee involvement and representatives in CPIC as well to be able to have that discussion. Here are some of the things that we're looking for, you know, in our new provider. I would. My experience is, and it's limited. And, I, and Camille, you can certainly join in if you want. <laughs> There is it, the, the schools that I've been in, the meetings that I've attended, and in talking to the parents, there is the tension between price and quality, right? I mean, we could certainly, when we start to lower the price of the items, the quality and heavily is going to suffer. So we want to try and find a balance when we're working with those uniform providers. Um, so there is the RFP process which is going through right now, and then the policy is not scheduled to be reviewed till 2020, 2021. So you might be able to achieve getting a better say better service for maybe some of those families through the RFP process that having to reopen the policy. My understanding, and I can be corrected here, is that we would have to go to the policy committee to have that policy then reopened. Trustee Agnew. So just some um, information, I, I, and I'm just going to respond a little bit to um, Superintendent McGillicuddy's comments as well, is, is, you know, I don't know the historical piece, but I do know that there are currently schools that are looking into um, whether they can have that conversation and they can have those votes about the uniform. So just, again, this tends to stir up, you know, what's going on. I think there's been um, much dissatisfaction with our current supplier. So I think that that is also causing some conversation. So just some of the anecdotal information that's come to me is, you know, looking at, again, you know, the possibility of not having a single supplier, um, um, you know, giving families choice uh, as far as, you know, where they can purchase perhaps, you know, the Navy bottoms, things like that. So that's something that's come back. Um, certainly quality versus price is always a consideration that has come back. And then also um, some concern around, and this is probably where the policy piece comes in, but some concern around um, how some schools have a uniform and some don't. And, you know, that is sort of a piece that, you know, parents are talking to one another about, right, is why does this school have it and this school doesn't, and this school is able to vote on it, so just something for consideration. And then also from a policing perspective, if we're going to use that term, is there are just there are some schools that are very strict about where you purchase your uniforms from, and what you know that those uniform pieces are being adhered to, and then there are other schools that are a little bit less strict on those uniform pieces, and so just some of the stuff that's come back, you know, while these conversations have stirred up. Trustee Duarte. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not even sure if price is the de determining factor. Uh, literally, if, uh, the price of the uniform is consistent across Halton, all the areas. But in Milton, literally all the schools have gone with uniform except I'm thinking OLF, which is uh, due sometime soon. Uh, so basically, in Milton is a newer community, a younger community, and uh, I'm thinking it's community-based. It may not be price point. Uh, a comment and then a question. Um, I, I would assume that um, 
you know, the, the manufacturers are basing, or the, sorry, the suppliers are basing their pricing on bulk orders that they're placing offshore. And then if we, if we loosen the constraints, then their volume's gonna drop, the price will actually go up. Which, so that'll be, that'll be a detriment. That's my knowledge of the textile industry. Uh, second question, uh, do we know how many schools um, in our system don't have a uniform policy? Trustee <laughs> um, Does CIAC um, have, is, is CIAC one of the stakeholders? Sorry, in this? Sorry. No, uh, no, I'm asking if CIAC also is one of the stakeholders on the selection when the RFP comes up. I don't believe so, but I, I can't answer for sure. Three, Mr. Chair. Um, I held the portfolio for uniforms for a number of years. Um, so I'll give you some, I'll answer the question, uh, Trustee and Tomasi. SIEC was not uh, represented at, at the last RFP uh, process that we, we engaged in in 2015. Um, 16, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, if, if you're considering possibly, you know, changing the policy, uh, and it, sorry, if you're considering changing the idea of going to multiple providers, uh, that is embedded in the policy now that it's a single provider. And so the timing, again, and I, I, I want to respect what uh, Superintendent Kroll just mentioned about uh, giving time for the, for, the new, for the RFP process to play out and then uh, look at the policy. However, if there is if there's serious consideration about expanding beyond one supplier, you might want to look at the policy prior to the RFP process because it will affect uh, the the pricing and the uh, service contract that will ultimately be decided upon. If it's more than one, uh, that that would would affect it. Um, regarding the idea of the parents questioning how some schools are in uniform and some are not. Uh, again, I, I've been part of this process right from its outset. I was one of the original schools that was a pilot school at St. Gabriel in Burlington. Both actually Hannah Perkassin and myself were principal, vice principal. Um, and at that time, there was discussion around this, this uh, board uh, table around the idea, well, should it be instituted board-wide, should it be school to school? And again, my own personal opinion at the time was I was hopeful that it would be one decided uh, just because it would make it easier for schools. But having said that, now being in the, in the portfolio for many years now, in some ways the communities have, have dis voted with, have decided themselves. And for whatever reason, uh, and Trustee O'Hearn, I've, I don't know the specifics why Georgetown, Halton Hills has never fully embraced it and why Milton loves it. I do know that, uh, and uh, uh, Superintendent McGill McGillicuddy is correct that no school has ever gone back out of the uniform. However, we've had several schools in the last few years re-vote and when they re-voted, it was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly to stay in uniform. Again, that's just information for yourselves to know that once, and recognizing, again, I'm a parent myself with kids in, that have been in uniforms. I've already invested a lot of money in uniforms. I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd be crazy about voting out the uniform because I can't imagine my girls wearing a uniform anymore if they didn't have to. Um, so I, I recognize all that. Um, but whenever we've had schools split, for example, St. Benedict this year split to St. Scholastica, again, the new community often overwhelmingly votes in favor of the uniform once they've experienced it. Again, take that for what it's worth anecdotally, uh, but again, my advice to you is if you're seriously considering moving beyond the sole provider, you might want to consider putting that policy for review before the RFP process uh, begins and ends uh, because that will happen this summer because the contract ends on December 31st of this, this calendar year. Secretary Daly, then uh, Trustee Agnew. Um, I, I think another consideration uh, could be, um, regardless of the school or the municipality where, where people are uh, choosing not to approve the uniform, um, it very well could be because that school community doesn't want a uniform. Um, and that's really, I think, when the policy was developed and it was decided that we would let individual school communities decide as opposed to a board-wide policy, it was exactly for that reason. Um, so I just want to say thank you. That's helpful, Superintendent uh, Cipriano. Um, and just uh, a comment um, just on what uh, Trustee Murphy had said is I agree with you. I, you know, you look at sort of that's the benefit of going with uh, one supplier, right, is that you have the numbers to hopefully bring down some of the pricing. I think some of the things that the parents are looking at is the availability to not necessarily go with 
a traditional uniform supplier per se for even part of that uniform. So looking to go to those retailers that currently offer, you know, uh, dress code type of um, um, garments. Right, so they could go to anywhere and pick up their navy pants or their. So I think that's sort of where the thought is with respect to multiple suppliers versus, um, you know, two um, uh, uniform suppliers per se. So they would maybe get their tops from a uniform supplier and then have the option to buy bottoms somewhere else. So I think that's where the thought came from. Professor Charlebois. Okay, so to maybe help clarify a bit, I mean, one of the reasons Georgetown could be rejecting it is because the closest ISW is 20 kilometers away from CTK. So it is, a, it is a fair distance. We have one in Oakville, we have one in Milton, we have one in Burlington. However, Georgetown, it is distance uh, to get there. Uh, I can speak on the fact that I've had to wear a uniform for the last four years, uh, that uh, ISW is actually substantially less expensive than McCarthy's. So that was a change. Uh, but I mean, the, uh, one of the, the big factors is that, you know, we, we've mentioned that like schools can edit their uniform policy on their own. I know being from Holy Trinity, our uniform policy in the four years that I've been there has changed two or three times from allowing hoodies to black t-shirts and white or black collared shirts and white collared shirts. The school rarely consults the community in a very effective way at all. I have never ever been part of this, uh, the, the vote to change our uniform policies, nor have most of the families that I know. Um, the decision for hoodies uh, really stayed between staff. I know because some staff didn't like the idea and we heard a few rants in class. Um, so I think that the, the idea of changing uniform policies based off uh, the school is a great idea. However, it is administra administration's responsibility to actually reach out the, to the community and students in an effective way and not just keep it kind of below the radar, maybe post a small link on the bottom left corner of their website hoping that, you know, assuming that maybe one person will find it. Uh, so definitely I think that in order for that section, that uh, solution to be effective, uh, if a uniform uh, change is in order, that everyone is notified effectively of it. Uh, as, as well as I think that, uh, you know, the, I the ideas of uniforms are, are not bad in any way. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a teenager. I've broken the uniform code countless times, uh, and I've been caught countless times. Um, however, I think that, you know, there are also compromises that can be made depending on the communities, whether it's, you know, not needing to buy the pants and just one of the shirts, because that's really all that you see. Uh, even between shoes, like I know St. Ignatius of Loyola still requires all black shoes, Holy Trinity doesn't, things like that. Uh, so I think that, you know, those are factors that could also help alleviate the cost. I mean no one really buys all black shoes anymore and shoes are very expensive these days. Uh, that will cut down your uniform cost substantially as well as the pants, things like that. Uh, but the main thing is, uh, you know, depending on the, the choices we want to make, if we want to stay with the, the school having the ability to make the changes on their own, that they do truly do need to reach out to the community and actually get the response opposed to keeping it below the radar. Thank you, Trustee Charlebois. Trusting on Tomasi. So, um, through you, Mr. Chair, good point, um, Trustee Charlebois. I, I'm just wondering if perhaps we need to, as um, Superintendent Cipriano said, that we should revisit our policy because all the points that you brought up all point back to our policy. So, I would think before we go to RFP, um, we need to look at our policy and deal with all these items. Thank you to you, Mr. Chair. Many of our discussions uh, in the past were about the sole supplier or not, and there have been some um, stakeholder feedback on our uniform policy that would be probably interesting for us to review. Um, I do concur that, you know, about the policy timeline so that we don't want to do the RFP and then change, right? So you want to, if we're going to change anything, it should be done before. And, um, and, and given time, probably for that to go out to the stakeholders, any changes we make, because it is going to impact the community a lot. And 
hopefully for the positive, but it'd be important to get their feedback as uh, Trustee William has mentioned. So that's, yeah, good. Thank you for bringing it up. Trustee goes on. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm getting confused. Um, I, just listening and just from hearing some feedback that whether it be online or through correspondence through parents, I think, again, it goes to the point of um, affordability but versus durability, right? We've got young kids who go through these uniforms and one of the things we hear consistently is, is yes, in school is very much more affordable. It might not, there might not be as much wear and tear with the high school students, but with the elementary students, um, there is, and, and the feedback is, is that MacArthur had a, a superior product that's what I hear consistently. But what I also hear consistently from the parents is, is look, we'll, maybe we look at it as more of a, a, pol a uniform guideline in including that, again, navy blue pants, uh, especially with our elementary kids because of the way they grow so quickly and the replacement value. Like, who's kidding who? You can go to Old Navy. There are certain places you can go and buy pants for 5 to $10 in comparison. And they're simple navy blue pants. And even these stores actually carry a uniform line. Um, so I think it is something that prior to the the RFP going out, I think it's something we should review just in good practice anyways, because why are we sending it out to tender without reviewing the policy, especially if we have to, because we have to, when we do the RFP process and we send it out and we commit, what is the length of the contracts that we're, we're entering into with these three years? Typically they've been three years, um, and in the past there's been extensions, but this current one is a three-year contract. Trustee Murphy? Uh, just uh, some comments. Um, I would be concerned that we're opening up a can of worms. Um, from my perspective, which is limited, I'll admit, it doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, so I would be concerned about going down this path. The, se the second comment just would be, in my opinion, it would be very hard to police if, um, if there's standardized uh, offer from one supplier, then it's a yes or no. You're either compliant with your uniform or you're not. If you open up um, saying, okay, it's it's blue pants, then how blue is blue? What shade of blue? And then it makes it very difficult and, or onerous to police. And I think that would be difficult. And, and the whole idea is, is uniformity, is to make it all look the same, right? So I would be concerned about uh, changing the policy to allow, open it up I think it would be very difficult to um, to police that, and we would lose the uniformity of it. Superintendent Crow. A little bit more information. So there's 32 of 46 of our schools that currently have uniform. Um, and the other thing that was I just want to that hasn't been mentioned yet that, that was important in the development of the policy, in my understanding, was that part of the reason that we go with a single source provider, we can say that they're using fair labor practices. We spend a lot of time through the RFP process. The, the companies that, that provide those tenders to us, they go through a very rigorous process to ensure that we can say to our clients, our parents, that you know these are produced in fair labor factories. Trustee Guzzo. I, and I appreciate, thank you for, obviously that is important. I know MacArthur's went through a huge rigor morale. I actually, I'm friends with the woman who led that as a student. Um, but just to go back and to Trustee Murphy, one of the things that was brought up that I heard as a comment from a parent was a, was a parent of a child with special needs who said that the uniforms that we provide don't necessarily meet the needs for their child. Um, so just a point that we talked about SEAC not being part of it. I think that that is something that we should look at. So we also have to make sure, as I understand the uniformity piece of it, but when we're looking at children that have special requirements or don't they don't fit that necessarily that uniformity piece so I'm assuming we have something that addresses that however I, I think it's important that we bring it to part of the table and I'm not saying that that's the answer mm -hmm. is that we change it but I think that if we're going to go through the RFP process it makes sense to tie that policy in ahead of time to ensure that the changes align before we send it out to tender. Superintendent Cipriano. Thank you uh, through you Mr. Chair. A couple things uh, just to address uh, Trustee Guzzo, yes, absolutely. Uh, our students with special needs who have uh, sensitivity to, to, to certain textiles or certain um, uh, touch, we do uh, both McCarthy's prior to ISW, both companies were very uh, accommodating in allowing parents to make their purchases of the appropriate clothing for their child and they would crest it at no cost. So our students with special needs who have those, uh, those 
a specific textile needs. They, they look like they're in uniform, even though their uniforms might be different. They, they might have a different uh, 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 makeup. Uh, just with regard to Trustee uh, Charlotte Bois' comments and concerns, I just want to be clear, uh, Trustee William, so I know that you, you mentioned you had never been part of a school vote for four years. Our policy around voting is only for elementary schools, so that's why you wouldn't have experienced that at Holy Trinity. There is no voting for our secondary schools. And schools within the policy, schools are given the opportunity to make changes, additions to their school uniform. They must consult, though, their school councils and their parent school, uh, Catholic school councils. So again, I, I don't know uh, specifically what happened at Holy Trinity, but I'm assuming that that would have happened every time they introduced a new product, whether it be a hoodie or some type of uh, change, they would have had that consultation with their Catholic school council and student council. Go ahead, because I was. This is just the last thing. I appreciate. Sorry, through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Superintendent uh, Cipriano. Um, so what I will say then is, is then, I think for because that comment came up in regards to a specific child in a school that doesn't have uniform, that then maybe the communication piece when we go to the policy. Uh, in the vote of the policy that that is communicated because I think that may be where the misconception is coming from and that's why we have some people who are saying we don't want a policy because of X, Y, and Z. So maybe that's something that we can look at in the sense of what is communicated and the guidelines that we set and I know it's by individual school but maybe if we help standardize what the piece is and we debunk some of the, the misconceptions that that might be more helpful. Trustees on Through you Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to everyone in the room. What a wonderful discussion we've just had, very robust. I would like to offer up for suggestion for us all to go and ruminate on this topic, right? We've brought it up for information. We come back on April the 2nd. If there's any more information, maybe we can reread the policy. And then at that time, if we feel it necessary to put in an action item or move it to policy, we can do it then. I'm just wondering how everybody feels about that suggestion. Secretary Daly. Um, at the risk of, of extending the conversation, I, I just will note to, uh, to trustees that we did review the policy February 2018. So uh, we're going to move on to the next item, which is Secretary Daly on autism update. I'm going to ask Superintendent Cipriano and uh, Wendy Reed Purcell, who's hung in there with us until 8:51. Uh, to provide uh, just a bit of an, uh, an update with regards to um, what's been happening provincially and potentially sure. uh, some of the impacts that we may be feeling uh, at the board level. Sure. Um, and thank you, uh, Director Daly, and uh, thank you, Wendy, for when she asked me what time should I be there, I said about 7.45. We should be on. So uh, I, I owe you an hour back. Uh, okay. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to talk about uh, the Ontario, uh, Ontario Autism Program. Uh, we're currently in the process of gathering specific data on the numbers of children with ASD currently receiving government-funded ABA, which is uh, Applied Behavior Analysis Services through the Ontario Autism Program. We're hearing that not all of our students that uh, will be fully discharged from the OAP now. Uh, at first we thought they'd all be coming back to us approximately April 1st. We're hearing now that uh, some will be, uh, their, their services will be extended into June, and they may not be coming back to our schools full time until June or even beyond that. Uh, we're working to determine how many students are scheduled for April versus June discharge. Uh, in addition, we're uh, gathering data on grade levels and levels of needs, because not every student with ASD that is receiving government therapy uh, have the same needs coming back to us. Uh, some are uh, will require very little in, in uh, adult support, EA support, some will require quite a bit, uh, comp and they have complex needs, they'll need more intense support. Uh, our greatest concern in response to the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services decisions to me, uh, is in having adequate EA support. Um, at the current number that we have, again, it's, it's an approximate number, we're looking at possibly 45 to 50 students. Uh, we've had our consultants meeting with our schools and our school special education resource teachers, and that's the number that we're, we're we're ballparking in the number of students coming back to us. Um, now, I know the ministry on, I believe, March the 15th, 15th made an announcement about funding. Uh, from my understanding, the $12,300 that, that, that they used, uh, that, that is the average funding that they, that they uh, provide to school boards for, uh, for per pupil funding. 
So all of our kids receive that. And that 12,300, when you consider that in Halton Catholic, as you all know now, I think you all had that presentation earlier, that we are the lowest funded Catholic sc or school board in the province, that number actually has decreased to 10,500. And when you consider again that these students are already, for the most part, the majority of that 45 to 50 students are already enrolled in our schools. Uh, they're just attending our schools on a part-time basis. So again, I'm not sure, there was not, there's no details, but I'm not sure if we're going to receive any or part of that, that 12,300 that was announced. And, and, and recognizing that many of these students come, come to us with very complex needs, we don't have uh, a, a stable of educational assistance which is waiting to be deployed. We've deployed all of our educational assistance, obviously, uh, when, when we received funding in, in, in for September. And so we are, we, we essentially, without any greater extra funding, would be uh, s providing these services with the same number of VAs that we currently have supporting all of the kids in our system. Um, the good news is that our priorities uh, in special education department continue to be to transition these students into our schools. We've done a lot of work with ABA strategies uh, for our staff. We have our behavior analysts supporting our schools. Uh, we, we've done a lot of uh, PD in some ways, very thankfully, uh, well in advance of this announcement, with prior to the, even to this government taking, uh, taking office, we supported our schools uh, over the last year or two years with AB, uh, what we call ABA for All strategies. We have different uh, projects happening in our schools, Stay, Play, Talk, uh, Peers. So we've been doing a lot of great work in our schools. So we are very well uh, situated. Uh, again, the biggest challenge will be uh, educational uh, assistance support for these students. Uh, again, going forward, we're hoping that we will receive more information around the funding from the government um, to help us uh, with uh, the work to support these students from April to uh, the end of June and then again into next year. Um, uh, we've hired a half-time uh, speech and language pathologist uh, to help students with alternative augmentative communication systems, which will help not only our students with ASD, but other students in communicating with their teachers and their classmates. Uh, we continue to uh, serve our students uh, uh, through our uh, TD rounds, uh, transdisciplinary rounds at Tier 1 and Tier 2, again, using our behavior analysts. And I'm really proud, again, this is prior to my, my role in, in the department, my, my predecessor, Dr. Brendan Brown, uh, we invested in behavior analysts at the board. Uh, for a board of our size, we have a large number of behavior analysts that support our schools. These are behavior analysts, BAs, we, we refer to them, that uh, they, they're trained in, in the methodologies that, that uh, these students are receiving privately right now, and they're training our staff in using what we, what we term educational uh, ABA strategies in our schools. So we're really, we, over the I can tell you over the last six months that I've been in the role, how many times, I can't tell you how many times I've been contacted by other school boards to find out what our model is because we're, we're well situated. And again, I, I give a lot of credit to Dr. Brennan Brown and w Wendy Reed Purcells here tonight. Uh, she's she's uh, done a lot of work in supporting other boards uh, uh, in, in the work that they're trying to do to support their schools. Cause, again, because we see this provincially as these are all our kids. We're supporting all these kids w uh, with these special needs. I'd be happy to answer any other further questions. Wendy's here, who uh, is, a, again, a, a fantastic resource to, to help you better understand the Ontario uh, uh, Autism Program and how the effect is happening, how it's happening in our schools. Trustee Agnew. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Cipriano. I just have one question. Uh, well, I have lots of questions. <laughs> But I have one question specific. So we spoke about, um, you know, possibly what that needs going to be for additional EA support. And we're not sure what that's going to look like right now. And I know that we have a robust BA um, contingency right now. But are we looking at needing additional uh, behavior analysts as well if we're going to have those students come into the school systems full time? Wendy, maybe that's a uh, we. That's not right now on our radar. Again, we uh, we. We, for board our size, for the, our population of students, um, we have a large number of BAs. Um, and again, the, B, the role of the BA is to support schools. It's, it's you know, coaching to train the, uh, the teachers and the certs and the RI teams in supporting their schools. And so uh, our, our most imminent needs right now are supporting those kids as they come into our classrooms. Sorry. Uh, I do have another question. So, um, and I, I understand that we are going to, we're not sure what those numbers look like right now, right, from April to June. So, I guess two parts. So, one is going to be for those students. We already have all of our allocations right now, I believe, for our EA supports. So, 
you know, what are we looking at as far as reallocations from that April to June, if necessary, and then from September onwards, um, what do we, I mean, we know there's no new funding. What's mm -hmm. the, what, how do we do that? How do we manage it's that? Through you, Mr. Chair. It's really right now on a case-by-case, -case, depending, because again, um, not every child that comes back to us from therapy is going to require the same uh, level of EA support. We know some will require, you know, full-time, one-to-one uh, support. And we will have to, in those instances, figure out, you know, school by school. Uh, it really is, unfortunately, robbing Peter to pay Paul, uh, to, you know, try and grouping students together, you know, trying to place these students in classrooms with existing EA support. Uh, it's not ideal. Again, without knowing a lot of details around the funding that's going to come with it, and even with the funding, um, hiring EAs is not an easy thing. We want to hire the best EAs, we want to hire the best staff. And so, I mean, it would, even if we do get the money, and we're hopeful we get some fu extra funding, uh, the whole process, by the time you go through interviews and, and hiring and placement, uh, even, and that's considering we have some really great quality staff just waiting to be hired. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainties. So right now, we're, you know, the plan is to plan for, in some ways, to plan for the worst, to do what, what we can with what we've got and then hope for September. I mean, for us, really, the, the long-term plan is really September, you know, looking at the funding in a way that we can maybe hire more EA support. Uh, uh, but in the short term, it's really a case-by-case. Case. Wendy, is there anything more you can add? information. Um, we have a uh, CPIC minutes that have been included as part of your package. Uh, Rosie, is there any other correspondence? No other correspondence. And then here, uh, questions? No questions. So um, we're going to move back into camera. Mr. Chair? Because we yes, sir. I have a question. Could I introduce it now? Ah, yes. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, it has been in the news in the last week about the changes to the class size for high school. Uh, can, uh, has any analysis been done? Could somebody provide an update of how it's going to impact uh, our planning? I can certainly update you in camera. Actually, okay. actually my error was back in camera. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so can I have a motion to move back in camera, please? Mr. Ian Tomasi, seconded. Trustees Arnota, 
All in favor? Motion passes. Um, does anybody need a five minute break before we go back into camera? Okay, five minutes. <laughs>